today. So if you would make a uh, particular uh, focus to try to speak into the microphone, not all of y'all have one, and so we'll need to make sure that they get passed around appropriately uh, to do that. Um, number two, um, we are going to have a chance for everybody to uh, speak today that wants to speak in terms of um, giving their feelings of what's going on, what's happening. Those will be made a part of, uh, of the record. I'm asking everybody to hold those to three minutes so that we're not here um, all day long. Some people may choose to speak shorter, but uh, that's where we are. We have, um, in the past, uh, gone through an approval of minutes process. This is going to be our last meeting. So um, my thought uh, on the issue of minutes for this meeting uh, that we're going through, and we'll discuss the meetings minutes from last meeting uh, in a moment, is that we uh, get them written up have them sent out to everyone for everyone's uh, comment to make sure that we are accurately uh, reflecting what those um, what's happening in the meeting. We'll get people's comments. We'll try to get a versions as many of them circulated as we need to, and get those out to everyone um, to uh, to be voted on. So because we're not meeting again, that to me seems. Um, a simple way of, of getting that done. Um, the next item, um, the other, yeah, let me, um, before we go into the minutes for last meeting, we've got a couple of different things on our agenda today. We've got um, questions or responses on uh, traffic that um, we've got to, uh, to look at and consider. We've got time for a discussion of the west end of the corridor. We have um, um, comments by all of the CAC members uh, that'll be a part of that. Remarks by the mayor. Um, so if I, I'm gonna try to keep things moving along so that we can get all of those things taken care of during our uh, our two hours that we're that we're here today, um, so any questions or comments about about that? That's good. Uh, so now we've got um, the uh, approval of the minutes, and I know that we have some some comments about those. Do you want to make those in general, and then we can talk about what to do? Sure. <clears throat> Uh, I have submitted uh, some change on the minute from uh, last meeting, and which uh, some people may not have chance to look at it because it was last minute submission, like a 2 a.m. last morning. Yes, <laughs> this morning. <laughs> so, <158. Yeah>. yes, <laughs> to be exact. But. Um, just one thing, uh, some are minor, but some are, uh, let's see, the question on uh, the consensus. The page 32 and 33, the consensus remark was made, but it was not said, so just wanted to make sure what's the purpose or practice or uh, something was not uh, brought up. I mean, I've got a suggestion. Sure. Um, the great thing about having this on channel three is that it is all, um, you know, it's all recorded. We can go back and take a look at it. Um, you've given that reference in the, um, um, you know, to the section in the YouTube for the time sure. piece. So my suggestion would be that um, maybe the folks that are drafting the minutes and you see if there's a uh, an appropriate piece, I'd ask everybody to um, uh, take a look at that segment, and then we would send those um, send those back out. Does that work? Yeah, that okay. that will work. Does that work with the rest of the committee? Okay.
Um, I want to make sure I'm understanding what you're suggesting. M Mina, as you know, has gone through the minutes paying great attention to the detail about some things that were said. Most notably, it has been said in several copies of minutes that consensus has been reached when, in fact, the, the tape doesn't actually reflect that. Are you suggesting that Mina present all of those and cite to the page so that those can be made a part of the record? So, Diane, two things. One is, you know, we do have the, the visual that anybody can go back and look at and make a transcript if they will. We have, for each meeting, presented a set of minutes, sent those out to everyone. Everyone has commented on those. We've made changes where those were necessary and then voted on those minutes. And to me, once those minutes have been sent, commented upon and voted upon, that those minutes are done. I, perhaps you misunderstood what I'm saying. It's the fact that Mina has had to actually make the changes that consensus, it was said in the minutes that consensus was reached when in fact it wasn't. And, and I agree with you, Bert. I'm not asking you to go back and revisit minutes that have already come through the committee. I think that what men has asked is, is absolutely fine, which is please go back and take a look at this particular segment and make sure it says what it says. She, we will then get those distributed again uh, to everyone with a, a marked kind of version or showing where those changes are, and then we'll get a chance to make sure that we are um, got those that are all approved by each of us, and we'll get that done. Any other questions? So we will be moving um, on from the minutes today, knowing that we will be electronically finishing minutes from last meeting and minutes from this meeting. Any other questions? Okay. So the next item on our agenda is the uh, follow-up questions and answers for the um, for the traffic study. And I was going to turn that over to uh, to Steve Goodrow. And Steve, remember, this is live. And so to the extent that you can um, speak and make sure that everybody's heard, not only here, but whoever might be watching. Thanks. Thank you, Bert. OK, uh, the next uh, few slides here, again, are to kind of guide our discussion. Again, we're going to just follow up on some of the traffic questions that we had last time, as well as uh, touch base again on uh, West Nashville and, and review that. Uh, what we received over the last few weeks was approximately 29 questions. Uh, 17 of those were around like the status of the project or background of the project. They include, you know, why, you know, more information about VISIM, uh, the studies that we, uh, the cases that were studied as part of the project, um, how this organization, how this group fits into the public involvement process, and just a variety of things like that, as well as um, looking at the corridor-wide model. Uh, last time we presented some particular information about the east and the west end because we felt that folks would be interested in that. But we really have an entire model that we will show you so that you're, you're satisfied that we've done the whole job. We didn't just do parts. So we'll take a look at that. And then uh, we also have uh, some questions on travel time and also some more de detailed questions on level of service. So we're going to take a look at each of those. Uh, how we're going to do this, I'm going to spend some time just on sort of the overview kinds of things. And then um, I'm going to have Najme come up and talk more about the, the full model. She's been working on this for quite a while. She's uh, you know, a really great engineer at uh, RPM. And uh, so she's, she's the most familiar with the model, so we're going to have her talk. And then we're going to have Jeff uh, talk more about the details of some of the items that uh, were raised in the uh, uh, questions we received. So again, um, just going back to some of these overview questions, uh, there were a number of questions about why VISIM. Well, VISIM is really the tool for modeling these kinds of projects. It's used predominantly everywhere for uh, BRT, for very complicated interchanges, things like that. It's probably the one, one highest level of, of an analysis tool we have. And it can measure or examine various cases in, in whatever way we want to cut or divide the data. So it's a very robust program. It's used 
almost exclusively for this kind of uh, project itself. So that's why we used VISIM. Uh, there were some questions about where it was used. Um, just offhand, it was used for uh, the Silver Line, Silver Line BRT in Grand Rapids that's up and running. It's used on Snelling now that's in study phase, preliminary engineering. Uh, we've used it on Ashland Avenue that's also in the, uh, the planning phase. Uh, we certainly used it on the Health Line, which has been up and running since 2008. Um, and they also used it out in Eugene, Oregon, which is also a, a project that's been up and running for quite some time. So it's used almost predominantly for these BRT projects. And the reason is that it can model every mode. It can model cars, buses, both local buses and BRT buses and people. So it's really the model to be used. Um, then, then we had some uh, uh, questions on, on the, um, the assumptions that went into our model. Um, our assumptions in the model are for design purposes, okay? So let's just throw that out there to begin with. One, we used current counts taken in January and February, so they're like new. We kind of put aside the old ones that were done in 2010, and we used new counts, so we know like current what's the traffic at the intersections involved. So that's important. Um, we use the most recent operating condition on the corridor, that is uh, with the different uh, mixed flow sections added. So it covers that. Um, we also use an updated forecast, a projection on the uh, future development. Um, some of the plans had changed and so we made some adjustments to that. So that's you know, again, we reviewed that with TDOT so that we weren't like uh, 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 over projecting or under projecting. I mean, they're also very interested in trying to, you know, get the right number out there that we're designing to. Again, this is for design purposes, which means how long do you want your, your queue links and things like that? So we want to make sure it's conservative, but not too conservative. Um, we assume no mode shift in the design. You know, intuitively, we believe that if we build a system that's fast and clean and efficient, that people will begin using it. But in our design, we want to make sure that we have uh, the curb lines and the queue lengths, you know, robust so that we don't come up short anywhere. So what we did is we just assumed in our model that the existing people, people in cars currently today wouldn't shift. So that creates a few more cars in our model, if you can imagine. But we did that on purpose so that we could design something, again, in the streets that would be robust and take cars. And we did the same for the concept of diversion. You know, as you can imagine, some cars were probably going to leave the corridor. Well, we did not take that into the account in our VISA model for design. Again, the purpose of these is to make sure we have maybe a little more traffic than, than we think so that it's a conservative design, it's robust, it could handle a few extra cars without a problem. So that's really what those design assumptions are meant to uh, provide. So we really feel like we've got a conservative assumptions for our design. So when we place the curbs, they're in a good place, we have plenty of extra room. So that was the point of the assumptions. Um, the case studies that we did in this phase Certainly we did the no build in um, 2014 and 2018. Uh, the purpose of that is to get you know, some comparative to what's gonna happen now and what's gonna happen in the future if we don't do anything. And then for um, the build, we did the AMP in 2018 and we did again with the current operating plan that we all understand with the, with the mixed flow sections. So it includes the recent changes. Um, we did not examine a variety of other operational scenarios. We examined the current case as we know it today. We can study other cases. Clearly, we've got a, a great model that's very robust that can look at a lot of things. But right now, the model, we just looked at the current case in, in the design process. So that's the cases that we've studied. Um, we also had some questions come up about, you know, has there ever been any before and after studies? And clearly there are. FTA actually comes back several years later and does a before and after study. Um, we went back and we took our um, Euclid Corridor Transportation Project that we did all the traffic work on. And that was in 2004. 
And at that time, uh, the bus travel time on the corridor was 36 minutes, approximately in the AM and PM. Um, I'm not gonna zoom in here, but these are, are roughly like 36 and change, 35 and change, 36 and change, kind of a number for, a, again, a, about seven to 10 mile corridor. So that was our study in 2004, 2004. And then um, if we go to um, FTA's um, before and after study that they did just as part of the project, again, they're also curious about how these projects perform. And uh, we also find that it's also 36 minutes today, actually. So what we built and what we projected for the bus it is accurate. So it kind of goes to say that the model can can project and, and do that information. Now I will have to say the before and after study did not provide information on automobiles. But again, if, if you can at least match one mode, that kind of says we're, we're accurate. So, so that's great. Um, there were questions about who, who did what kind of work and, and when was it done and those kinds of things. Um, we had traffic counts, like I mentioned before, in January, February of this year. Um, a company by the name of All Traffic Data did that work. Uh, it was done with uh, video detection, and uh, they got it done really quickly, which is fantastic for us, and you know also for the project budget in general. So that was super. The VSIM, the VSIM modeling was done from January through September, and the lead on that was RPM, and uh, our staff uh, served as a peer review as we've done a bunch of these things, and we also helped set up some of the base models for that. So we were kind of an integrated team on that with RPM leading some of that. Uh, that work is still under review by TDOT, and as we get comments or questions, we're gonna address those, because again, they're also interested in a system that's gonna work and work well. So we're working with them on that. We've also worked on a diversion analysis. Again, we're trying to estimate um, how many folks may leave the corridor. Um, and so we've been on the lead on that, and RPM has been doing review for that. And again, TDOT is reviewing that information, and we've gotten different comments back and forth, but eventually we'll get those wrapped up with TDOT. So that's where those are. Um, and again, our intention is that these studies would become available once TDOT has accepted those. We'd like to have numbers that we feel are, are acceptable. So, so those would become available after TDOT has uh, finished their review. So th those are who, who's done what when. So we've kind of, we've covered those kinds of questions. Um, other questions that have come up, um, we've had some questions on how many buses. I know we've kind of touched on that a few times. Uh, the goal is that there would be uh, 11 buses total, one, 10 in operation, and one uh, as a spare. Uh, so that's kind of kind of the, the game plan now. Uh, the other question was how does the CAC, this, this process, fit into the public involvement? I mean, this is a great question. Um, this is gonna be a part of the environmental document. Just like other public meetings, the questions, the comments will all be recorded in the public involvement section of the environmental assessment. So this will all become a record of that document, which is great. What that means is, as we move forward, we're gonna have to consider the questions and comments that have been raised here as we move forward in the design. So you know, that's, that's where it's at, that's how it fits in. All right. If there are any other questions on some of these global sorts of questions, we'll yes. move on. Go ahead. I have questions. Sure. Uh, you said a uh, VISM, uh, VISM accuracy comparison on the Euclid study, uh, 36 minutes was projected, and afterwards study was 36. Right. So I'm assuming that is on bus, not the delay time uh, that is about the, the automobile. Yeah, the, the after study didn't have any um, traffic information in it. So in other words, if uh, the traffic around the bus was delayed, the study was conducted before uh, the bus was uh, placed, but you don't have uh, accuracy or study on that uh, affected traffic around the bus. Right. Thank but you. We did, we did the similar study here, where we looked at delay and level of service and all of those things on the corridor. And at that time, the DOT approved that work, and we just, you know, again, moved on step <coughs> by step, covering all the bases. Thank you. Others? Um, 
I have a question. Sure. Uh, this is the second meeting at which you've <clears throat> reminded us that these studies, I guess, largely part of NEPA or being submitted as they are done to TDOT. Why can't those studies be made available to the public now, to this committee? I mean, we're ending our... That's a great question. I mean, we'll bring it up with MTA. I mean, <laughs> sure, it would be a draft version, but uh, we, can, we can certainly ask MTA, see what they would like to do with that. Right. Sure. Diane, we can... Is this on? We can, we can give it to you. I mean, we just prefer to finish things before we put it out in public. Just makes common sense. <clears throat> well, that could be up for discussion, but I won't take the panel's time. I do have a specific question sure. about... Uh, during last meeting's traffic analysis, you went through things like time of transit, um, it, but, but the, the traffic study that we were presented last time omitted East Nashville and the Central Business District. So are those portions also in front of TDOT, or are you going to present those yes, they, in the they entire? Yes, they have all of them. Right? And we'll, so sh we'll is, show you um, today that we have an entire, just is, don't Ms. anyone think we've studied bits and parts. We have a model that goes from East Nashville all the way to all the way to. But, but, but for example, specifically, you actually I think. It was hey, Diane, strange. can you speak a little bit more directly? And you think there's someone who can't hear me? Thank you. Um, <laughs> we want to make sure everybody can hear you. Ralph, Ralph <laughs> clarified that he could hear me quite well. Um, um, specifically. Um, and I believe it, it may have been in some exchange between you and Mr. Hammond, but specifically we were talking about times of transit uh -huh. and the predictability of that. And I wondered how complete that could be given the fact that you omitted the central business district. Well, we didn't East. omit anything. We just showed you what we, we felt that you would be more interested in West End and East Nashville, so we didn't prepare information on downtown and West Nashville. So specifically, though, at some point, times of right transit are going to be yes. included in the entire yeah. corridor? Najme and uh, Jeff will present those following my discussion. Um, and I'm sorry, one more question. Sure. Uh, 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 among the outstanding information that the public doesn't have yet, but TDOT does, are those the studies that you told us would be available about the impact on uh, cross streets that are uh, residential, as well as the critical intersections that have been it, reviewed? Yes. I mean, that, that information is all being analyzed. Our model itself studies each of the cross streets and the level of service on them. Are we going to be able to see any of the, particularly yeah. the intersections that lead into residential neighborhoods today? Um, the ones that we've counted, yeah. And then we've got a diversion analysis. And, and if you're interested, maybe I'll offer this, Diane. We could sit down and we could show you everything in our office. We have my, a huge My model, time is your time. And that would be great. I mean, we could dig into as much detail as you'd like to. Thank you. So. Okay, Najme, would you like to uh, take over here and uh, begin just showing our whole model? By the way, she's been working really hard on this model to make it work great, so. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Najma Jami with RPM Transportation Consultants. And as Steve said, I'm just going to... Into the mic, please. Yes. <laughs> Is it good now? <laughs> no? Is it better? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to go through the corridor-wide questions. 
And uh, the majority of the questions that we received about that um, were referring whether we actually analyze the whole corridor and if we have both models that cover all the intersections along the AMP route. And you can see the questions here, like is there a breakdown from 12th Avenue uh, through downtown to show or the traffic study that we omitted East Nashville and downtown, why? And their question asking about um, the total travel time. So um, they're mainly asking, is there a model for the complete corridor? And the answer to that is yes, which um, to make it more clear, I'm just going to um, show you the two models that we have. <coughs> You probably remember from the last meeting that we said because um, our corridor, I can sit here. I guess I can't have the PowerPoint and model at the same time. So uh, because our corridor is uh, pretty large in terms of number of intersections, so to get a better and uh, more reliable results, we analyze the corridor under two separate models, west and east. And this is our west model, which actually starts from west and and Bosley Springs and goes all the way through the midtown and stops at Broadway and 12th Avenue. And we only split it because it's so large, it's even hard to manipulate in the computers itself. Okay, so this is like a huge analytical tool. And then here's uh, where our east model starts. Right after the end of the west model, it starts at Broadway and 10th Avenue and goes all the way through the downtown following the AMP route. This is the uh, 8th Avenue and goes through the Commerce and then 5th Avenue all the way through the Gay and J Gay Street and J uh, Robertson Parkway, and then goes all the way to the Woodland Street, and then Main Street, and the <clears throat> easternmost end of the route in East Nashville. So again, we did include everything in our model. We just have them separately in two separate models. Um, and then before going back to the questions, there were some uh, um, general questions how we came up with these numbers. So I'm just going to briefly go through how we actually input the data in the model and how we um, actually get the results out of the model. So to start with, I mean, you can see all these. Each of these black, um, we call them note, that when I click on that, they're yellow. Each of them, are, um, you can see that these are intersections. And we basically need to start with inputting the data, which is start with uh, building the geometry of each intersection based on the lane configuration. And then we have the data for the volume, turning volume. Um, I can show you some intersections that here is where we input the volume. So from this ramp, we have relative flow, which is the um, through volume, like 200 volumes going through, and there are 400 volumes going to the right. So we had to input all those data. And we started with the existing, because we had the field um, data and field volume that we had. And then um, there are some other information that we also need to code it in our model, which were um, like signal timing, so each, in, each intersection has individual signal timing that we had to code, and here is where we input those data. So it just takes a while, okay. So we have individual signal controller for each intersection, and then we uh, input the green time, yellow time, red time, and everything else that we needed, pedestrian signal group and everything. And then, 
when we call this is the micro simulation, we actually need to define every single thing. That's a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing about it is that we can, we are, it has a really good capability of um, getting any type of data that we want. We can ask about any information, but also when we build our model, we need to define every single thing. Like for this intersection, you can see these yellow blocks. These are the, we need to define when the, cars want to turn left, they need to reduce their speed to like 15 miles per hour and everything like that. And then there's some other information like conflict area. So we need to say, you see this red and green. And it, if they want to turn right on red, um, they need to stop for the through traffic. So we had to go through all these uh, details to make our model work the best. And um, I mean, we went through the calibration procedure uh, last time and um, the data that we started with the existing model because we had the real data. So we input all the information there and there are standard um, procedure that we can see whether our model can replicate the existing condition to its best or not. So we followed that. Th those are based on the volume and then uh, travel time. So we followed that and when we felt enough confidence, then we started to go through the no build and build scenario. So, um, and then after all these things, uh, we started to the, we started um, building the three different scenarios, um, which existing no build and build under AM peak hour and PM peak hour. And then we had to run our simulation. And when I say we run, we actually uh, run the simulation for 10 times. And the reason behind that is um, even for like real life, if the morning peak hour is from 7.30 to 8.30, if you leave a certain point at um, so 7.30, you, you're going to experience different travel time if you leave a certain, the same point at 7.45. So this is a very standard uh, method for simulation that you actually do multi-run and the result that you see for travel time or delay and everything is the average of those 10 runs. So we just wanted to make it more uh, reliable. Um, so I think... Um, this probably covers very briefly how we came up with the numbers and what we report. And then um, I can show you after we finish the run, we go through the result list. Before you leave this slide, can you show us uh, the intersection of uh, I-440 and West End on the west where you're exiting to go east on 440 into town? Oh, I-440? Mm-hmm. So, this is actually a good example because this is the one, uh, the off-ramp on the north side of the west end. This is where we're actually implementing a new signal and we are adding uh, another right turn lane into the off-ramp. And then this one is, um, I don't know which one, uh, which off-ramp you're questioning, but this is the other I-440 off-ramp. Isn't that the east off ramp yes. showing three lanes? Yes. And it's so, going. And, okay. So we're going through, and that's the Murphy Road. So there, we are still having to bus lane in the middle, and then this is the new signals, which is currently operating on signalized. And if you went a little bit further west, uh, you would see where the the. Okay, so that's where it's the mid lanes end and you go to curbside. Correct. Now can you go back to Murphy Road? Sure. So this short segment, um, to keep the capacity in the eastbound, we have uh, one lane for the bus, which would be a reverse lane. And then you can see the lane configuration for both approaches. Okay, thank you. Sure. <clears throat> okay. And then, so back to the question, um, it was asked for the total travel time for the route. So we have our west model, which we defined, as I said, we need to define everything that we want the output from that. It doesn't mean that 
it's not there, but we just need to ask every single thing that we want to see the result from that. So we had a uh, travel time measurement defined in the West model from St. Thomas Hospital to the um, Broadway and 12th Avenue. And then we had in the East model, we had two travel time measurements, one in downtown starting from uh, Broadway and 10th Avenue, going all the way along the amp route, and then stops at uh, Union Street and 2nd Avenue. And then we have another segment of uh, travel time, which starts from there and going all the way through the <coughs> easternmost of the route at five points. So, I mean, you've seen East Nashville and West uh, model travel time, but I'm just going to show you in few next few slides, the total travel time for the total route. And when I said that we are looking at the average, I'm just going to show you, like for this one, we're going to the result list, and then we want to see vehicle travel times. I'm just going to filter some data, but we don't need. So you can see Simron 1, 2, 3, 4, and for each travel time that we defined, we get 10 runs, and then at the end, we get the average run for that from the, those total 10s, and then that's the result that we actually show in, in our report. So <clears throat> going back here. Yes, Trish. I, have, I haven't gone through the, those times yet. Oh, you haven't? Yeah, I was just showing the model. No, I'm just about to do that. Just having a problem switching from the presentation to the model. And I hate to have you hurry, or y'all hurry through this, but we have, um, you know, we need to just keep moving as quick as we can. I don't know why I don't see that. All right, there we go. Okay. So these are our travel time results. Uh, you've seen uh, the peak direction for the most, uh, West model. We showed that in the last meeting. So I'm just going to pass through that. You, we, you've seen the result uh, for both scenario existing, future without AMP, future with AMP, and then future on AMP. Um, and then these are the travel time results for the downtown that we haven't shown uh, previously. And then the East model. and then. I'm just going to go through the total route travel time. They're combining all those three. Um, if you have time, we can go through each of them separately. But this is the uh, total uh, route travel time starting from West End and St. Thomas Hospital going all the way to East Nashville at five points. Um, again, we have three different scenarios. So uh, how long does it take to drive uh, a car today? Those are from our model output. So during the AM peak hour, if you start eastbound, start from St. Thomas Hospital going to the five points. If you drive a car today, it's going to take 27 minutes and 58 seconds. And then uh, when we input the future volume and run the model, the average result shows um, to drive a car, it uh, takes 30 minutes and 10 seconds, which shows 18.66% uh, slower than the existing car travel time. And then future with AMP, with the modification that we applied, you can see the travel time uh, gets quicker by 9.4% uh, during the AM peak hour eastbound. And then if you ride on the AMP, you can see the range. And we went through that uh, last time. The range that you see, it's because whether we apply the um, signal, uh, transit signal priority or not, the lower range shows uh, if we do have the TSP in our signal system, and the higher range shows if we don't um, apply that in our system. Um, and you can see other travel time for the westbound during AM peak hour and then um, eastbound, westbound during PM peak hour. I can go through any of them if you want to. I think. Yes, I have one uh, clarification. 
at the last meeting, I asked uh, no build scenario showed just uh, exactly the same, uh, but only the AMP build scenario shows with uh, signal optimization. So there's mo uh, no study on no build with signal optimization. So I requested if there's a study uh, without AMP, but with signal optimization and so forth. So in this built scenario, I really don't know what causing the speed up, if it's AMP or signal. First off, um, during the analysis, there was a, uh, a case performed for what they call a systems management case. So, so in that case had, um, I think, uh, BRT light and some amount of optimization. So there was a study done earlier, not, not in this phase. Now as far as how this breaks down, as far as the time savings in our current numbers, obviously there's some, some savings from what we like to call um, access management kinds of things by putting that median and, and, and removing some of those mid-block lefts, you actually save some time, so you get some time there, as well as um, some optimization. And so all of those things together create some of this time savings. And then there was one question asking about the um, bus speed along the whole uh, route. And since we have the range for the tra uh, bus travel time, and then the distance for the route is 7.1 mile, considering the relationship between distance, speed, and time, these are the numbers for the uh, bus travel time. And if you could read those numbers out loud, please. Sure. Um, AM peak hour, uh, the eastbound, the bus travel, the bus speed would be 13 to 13.8 mile per hour. The average speed for the westbound uh, during AM peak hour is 13 to 14.1 mile per hour. And then um, during the PM peak hour, the eastbound direction bus um, speed would be 11.7 .7 to 12.5 mile per hour. And then the westbound direction would be 13 to 14.2 mile per hour. And the average speed of all of those for all scenarios, it's 12.7 uh, to 13.7 mile per hour. And that includes the stops too. So those are the answers for the model and corridor wide questions. I'm just going to ask Jeff to go through the more detailed questions. And just since we have an audience uh, and some of it on TV, I understand, last month we were asked by the chairman to submit our questions as soon as possible, and I think they were submitted within a couple of days of the last meeting. And so everybody will understand, the members of this committee did not receive these slides until approximately three hours ago. So we have not had a lot of time to review them and take a look and ask questions because they, uh, but virtually a month went by before we got answers to our questions. The last set of, uh, of uh, questions are what I'm gonna cover, and the, there were a few more that had to do with uh, some more detailed aspects of the traffic analysis. What Najmeh had just presented is, is the actual tool that we used, uh, as well as the travel time that was output from that tool. But we talked about last time there being another consideration that we really wanted to pay attention to, have to pay attention to, need to, and that is the overall intersection delay at every intersection along this corridor. If we don't, if we simply look at travel times, uh, we might miss uh, some of the impact of some of the cross streets has been brought up. And, and we might be unduly penalizing people coming in to the corridor on minor approaches in favor of having people go up and down the corridor uh, really towards getting a great travel time. So we need to make sure we, we are looking at all intersections, all approaches of the intersections in the corridor. And that's what we presented and there was some question having to do with that. <clears throat> it's a lot of text up here, a lot of words and a lot of numbers. Really it's all asking um, one major thing and that is how do you come up with average uh, intersection delay at an intersection? 
Level of service I'll show you in just a second is a direct output from intersection delay. So the real question is how do we come up with intersection delay? The model that you've just seen is our primary tool for doing that. It, it takes into account traffic volumes, signal timings, lane configurations, uh, a lot of other th strange things that might be coming in the corridor, U-turns and on-street parking and all of these things that are part of or are not going to be part of the corridor under the proposed cross-section and analyzes those and rolls them all in. Uh, and so it's, it's not as simple to say you know, the capacity of a lane is this and you take it out and, and what might happen with that, but we really have to look intersection by intersection, how much green time is given to any one of approach and, and those types of questions. So I said this is all kind of the same question, but there are three distinct components to it. And the first one comes in the second bullet, and, and that is, um, you know, we, we said that there will be some intersections that with this project will actually see a degradation uh, of service in the form of an increased delay, and that's correct. And we'll look at a couple of examples, and, and some of those are pointed out here. Uh, West End at Murphy and the AM Peak is one of those, 16th Avenue and so forth. The second component to that uh, is in the next to last bullet that talks about um, sometimes we see an increase in delay and yet the level of service stays the same. Why is that? We'll look at that in just a second. And then the third one has to do with um, pointing out that there were some that had a significant change uh, in level of service, all of these being changes toward the positive. In other words, with the project, level of service and, and delay actually got better. And we'll take a look at those as well. And that, and that is true, that's a correct reading uh, of the data. And then, you know, the, the, the overall question are what are the causes for these three things? So we'll look at that. Start in the middle with why you can have two different delays and yet have the same level of service. It just requires a definition of what level of service actually is. This is a table that it comes from the, the engineering reference manual that defines uh, level of service. It's the highway capacity manual. Um, it, this is, is the latest version and level of service changes depending on what type of a facility you're looking at. So if you're looking at a lane on the interstate, uh, it, its level of service is based on something totally different than what we're looking at here with signalized intersections uh, because you really don't have signal delay on the interstate. There aren't any traffic signals. When we're looking at an, an arterial, in particular an urban arterial like this one, uh, the standard is to define intersection delay or, or level of service by intersection delay, signal delay. That is delay that is created by the presence of a traffic control device, in this case being traffic signals. The way it's defined is, is given in the chart here. Level of service A is any intersection that has an average control delay of 10 seconds or less. That means for any vehicle that approaches this intersection, no matter what leg of the intersection it's on, uh, if it has an, an average control delay of less than 10 seconds, that intersection is gonna get a level of service A. And I'll show you how we come up with the average, uh, given that there are a lot of, there, there are usually 12 different turning movements at any one intersection. Anything between 10 and 20 seconds is a B, 20 to 35 is a C, and so forth. And so if you have, if you have a signal that under one scenario has a delay of, of 25 seconds, and under the other scenario has a level of service or a delay of 28 seconds, they're both going to get a level of service D. Two different delays, but same, excuse me, C, but same level of service. Okay, so it's just a threshold. Engineers have to draw a line somewhere, and this is, this is where those lines have been drawn. I would point you to level of service E where it says the limit of acceptable delay. That means in, in most urban settings, engineers typically, and E doesn't sound very good, I don't think there were E's on report cards, but if there were, you, you would not have been uh, welcome to bring an E home, I feel sure. Um, it sounds not very good, but it's important to note that we recognize that in urban settings uh, where, where uh, capacity is limited and congestion is, is, uh, is sometimes predominant, that is an acceptable level of service. Uh, I would also point out that that tends to mean that your volume co to capacity ratio, your VC ratio as it's, as it's pointed out here, is approaching one, and that's the most efficient our infrastructure can be. That means we didn't provide a lot of excess capacity, but at the same time, uh, we're not trying to cram too much traffic through an intersection that it's not well designed for. 
So, I, so you know, anything uh, E and below is, is generally considered acceptable in heavily congested corridors. Um, Metro or TDOT or whoever's looking at this may well look at an F and say, you know, that's okay. It, it, it's, it's 80 seconds and it could be 300 seconds. We see those kinds of delays sometimes. Uh, and, and so um, the, the industry is changing a little bit from this quantification of level of service because it is often misunderstood, but that's where it is for now and that's the tool that, that we are, are showing. A little bit about how you take um, a, a bunch of different individual movements and come up with an average intersection delay uh, might be important to note. This is just a hypothetical intersection and as, as she showed in the model, we can get results and we do get results from every individual turning movement at every individual intersection. Comes up with a lot of numbers to have to crunch. Um, and how we do that is we take the volume you see in the second column there uh, and we take the delay that comes out of the model for each of those turning movements, multiply those two numbers and you get a, a volume delay. Volume times delay gives you that last number in that last column. For this hypothetical intersection, we have 4,353 vehicles which travel through this intersection in, during this peak hour. And that equates to 245,000 plus um, seconds of delay for everybody that went through the intersection. We then use a weighted average formula where we look at the weighting of the, uh, the number of cars and, and the time it took them to, to get through that intersection, its delay, uh, and, and we divide those out. And so for that hypothetical intersection, you would be looking at a 56.39 second delay. Is it plausible that any one car who might approach that intersection would have that actual delay? It is, that's the average though. And so sometimes we will give more green time at a signal to the major approach because it has more traffic and that can bring down our, over, our overall delay. And that means we have to take time from somewhere else and we will do that from a minor approach uh, that has fewer cars using it. Uh, and so that's, that's the give and take uh, of, of our signal analysis. I won't spend a lot of time because I've got, for every intersection that was asked about in, in uh, two slides ago, we do have this type of a table. I don't really intend to walk through, but uh, can certainly answer any questions, but it does get to the question of how did um, certain intersections change their delay given the two scenarios. We're generally interested in how the no build and the build condition compare. That's the same base year. Um, generally the same parameters in terms of traffic volume and so forth. Let me point out three reasons why delay changes from the no build column into the build column. The first is traffic volume and we pointed this out last time. We haven't gone in a, in a great detail but it's, it's been mentioned that the, the build scenario, uh, as does the no build, both of these include traffic projections through the year 2018 but the difference is the build scenario does assume that some of that new traffic that will come onto the corridor between now and 2018 would use the amp. So we do take some reductions for that, and so there is a difference in the volumes uh, for each uh, intersection. Now I would point out here as you look through this list of volumes, note that that's not necessarily what we told the amp, what we told the model to simulate. We talked about last time we put that in, and it uses its algorithms based on research, and it and it puts in volumes uh, as it will. And we talked about that, and that was a large part of our calibration. So just because you're seeing a number here doesn't necessarily mean what we told it, uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, certainly doesn't mean in this case that uh, we think under the under the build condition there'll be a significant volume of, of less traffic uh, as we're proposing here. That, that comes about for different reasons. Let me see if I can show you, uh, this is 31st Avenue in the morning. Again, you, you put all these numbers in and, and do the weighted average and you get uh, a little bit um, worse, I guess, operations, a little bit more delay under the build condition. Uh, it's only by less than two seconds, but it is there. Uh, and so sometimes we see that and, and we might say a number of intersections has, have increased delay, but you also need to pay attention to how much. And when we see a 40 second delay and a two second change in that, uh, as we look at those numbers, that doesn't alarm us tremendously. 
25th Avenue uh, was another one that asked about. Again, uh, intersection delay on average goes up uh, about six seconds under the build condition. And, and I would remind you that any of these that we showed were kind of the critical intersections. Uh, there are 55 signals in this corridor, and we're showing you a handful of those. Um, so the, the vast majority um, increase or increase significantly uh, in terms of its operations under the build condition. But we're showing you some that uh, they're tough intersections, and you all know it because you drive through them uh, often. 16th Avenue here uh, is one that is it might be more um, impacted by new development than some of the others. I won't go through the details. Here, here's one where um, we come to the second way we can get a different delay. We talked about volumes. Another way we can get a different delay is signal timing. And this is one of the key tools that we have to help um, design this corridor in terms of how much green time or, or yellow time we might want to give different traffic movements. And this is, uh, this is actually the, the 440 ramp we were just talking about, the triple right turn lane uh, intersection. And so the northbound right, uh, you see, has a delay under the no build of 17.73 seconds. And that actually goes up quite a bit to uh, 25.64. The eastbound through, however, has a delay of six, uh, has a delay of 53 seconds, and it goes down tremendously to, to almost eight seconds. And the way we get to those is we we robbed. That's only a two-phase signal. It's very simple signal operation. One side gets red, one side gets green, and then they and then they swap. Uh, that's not common in this corridor, but it, it's very easy. I use this one as an example because it's kind of easy to visualize. All we did in that was that we took eight seconds uh, away from uh, the northbound right and gave it to the eastbound through and then looked at some of the coordination parameters uh, through there as well. And that's how we can achieve, in that case, we go from a, an overall intersection delay of 36 seconds, which was a D, to about 18 seconds, which is a B. And so just from a, a, a signal timing change, we can sometimes get... Um, Let me go back to 31st, if you would. Is sure. that uh, information gathered after the connector or before the connector was put in? This is after the connector. Our counts were made in January of this year, uh, and the model does include uh, the connector as a, as a fourth leg of the intersection. And the traffic from 28th, which connects into 31st, was Cor all of okay. Correct. Correct. Let me point out one more thing here at 31st because this is, this is important. This is during the, the PM peak. Um, I won't go in maybe to the numbers except to say, if you're familiar and you've ever observed the operation of 31st Avenue, it's, it operates in what we call split phase, and that is everybody coming up 31st from the Vanderbilt side gets green, and then everybody coming from the Centennial Park side gets green, but not at the same time. It's called split phase, and we have to do that because the way the lanes are configured, it's very inefficient. Um, in, in that, uh, scenario as it exists today, those side streets are getting 96 seconds. Now, keep in mind that's out of 150 second cycle length. So they're getting almost two thirds of the green time at that intersection during the evening peak. As we look at that and we've made some lane adjustments and reconfigured how some of those lanes would work on the side streets, haven't added anything, but just redefine those and take away that split phase, it lets us take away the split phase operation, we can be much more efficient with our, our intersection. We still run a 150 second cycle, but instead of 96 seconds, now we give the side street only 59 seconds. And you can see what it does. It makes the delay go up on those side streets, but by three seconds or two seconds uh, or one second. It's a very minor increase uh, as a trade-off for what we get to give more, much more green time to, to, uh, to West End. And so it's those kind of changes that, that make up for the fact that in this intersection, uh, we have turned one of the through lanes into a, into a transit lane, but we can, we can begin to overcome those type of a things through, through some signal operations and timing. And, and we see here uh, the overall intersection goes from an 81, which was the only F that we have uh, in the corridor under the no build, to a, a level of service E at, at 55 seconds. Still not great, 
Not a magic bullet, we're still gonna note congestion through here, but it's gonna be at a much lesser rate and, and, and the ability to, to put transit service like this and not impact traffic more than we have is, is something that, that uh, we're proud of. I won't go through, there were some questions asked about um, uh, this as well, 30, uh, 25th, we had a, a, about a 10 second um, betterment of traffic operations here. Uh, we also had some question about 13th and 14th, but I would say all of these kind of operate the same way. The principle is the same. We can change volumes and we can change uh, signal timing, and that's where we get uh, major changes in the delay at any of these intersections. There was a question about side streets, and let me just, don't know if I can clarify that any or not, but I'll try. Side streets, as you saw in the model, I would define side streets as the minor approaches to any intersection in this corridor. Okay, that's what I view as side streets. Those are all in this model. Um, as you can, as, as you just seen, we do account for delay at those side streets. We're very concerned about that. That doesn't mean they always get better, and sometimes we take time away from those for the, for the benefit of, of the more major use approach, uh, but they are all there, and they have been accounted for, and, and we don't hide high levels of service or high delays or anything on that. Um, so if that's what's meant by side street, then certainly they are all present. Any, any questions on that? A lot of data, a lot that you got um, very recently, but in from this presentation uh, of what folks have gone through, are there any questions of the data that's been presented, how it was calculated, anything that people would like to ask uh, Jeff or the team? May, may surprise some folks coming from me. Um, I think we're all glazed over. I can just see the whole, everybody in the room's glazed over with this much data, and it's highly professional, and it's uh, it's highly scientific. Um, and, and so when all is said and done at the end of the day, I, I know some of this you're dealing with, you know, statistical margins on the edges here in terms of changes. You know, is three seconds matter? Does 10 seconds matter? Does a minute matter? Um, in, in, the, in the opinion of the consultants, is, is this worth doing? Is the, pro <laughs> is the project worth doing? <laughs> You might as well start, you know. You're, you're asking. You forget, Lewis, if they say yes, if they, if they say no, it's not worth doing, they go off the meter and they no longer get paid. Uh, so right. if, if, th if their they, answer may be a little tainted. If, if, if they say no, we can all go home, right? <laughs> that would be I, I my would preference. Say this. <laughs> my, my answer would be tainted in the way that a Boeing engineer would be tainted towards flight. We, we believe we can design this and that it will work effectively. That's been our job to do. Is, is the model does two things, our analysis does two things. One is, it helps to inform us as to what design parameters we need. Uh, green time we've talked about, turn lane length and that kind of thing, en enough to, to contain storage and all the, the different aspects of traffic that we need to be sure that we're accommodating. It also helps us to demonstrate what we think the impacts of, of such a project might be, and we've done our best to, to do that. Uh, I'll not make a personal um, opinion of, of the project, uh, because that's not our job to do. Our job is to, to do our best to give you uh, and, and the public uh, objective information and, and exercise our talents the best we can uh, to demonstrate what we think that the best design needs to be and the impacts uh, of traffic will be uh, under the proposed Mr. Chairman, I just have a, two very specific questions. Um, Please. I, I just, again, uh, I, for clarification, when you were going through the build versus no build time at intersections, tell me again, was adaptive traffic signaling used under either the no build or the build when you calculated the times? Uh, adaptive traffic signal is something we've, we've never been a part. You know what adaptive traffic signal, where, where the signal timing even changes Correct. based on Correct. traffic conditions. So, so under neither condition was that <coughs> considered as a part of the timing? 
That's correct. This is not an adaptive signal project. And, and, the, and the second question, is this, is this study, uh, and I forget the name of the manual, but is this part of the VISM model that you're using? It is what part of that? The, the part that you've just taken us through, the bill yes, versus... Yes, ma'am, it is. All, all, of these, all of these numbers come directly from Okay, the VISM then my model. question about the VISM model is, is this used in any other planning other than the planning for a AMP-like or a BRT process? It is. It was actually developed uh, to, do, to do corridor and, and highway uh, traffic modeling. The co transit component has come on later. Uh, we find that out through, through uh, many updates to the, the, uh, the software. So yes, it is a widely uh, known and utilized traffic analysis software. And I guess my third specific a moment ago, Mr. Hammond, you used the term side streets as being minor approaches to the corridor. But I believe within NEPA, specifically what they want to know is not how much time will that car take to get on the corridor, but what the impact will be on traffic through neighborhoods. In other words, traffic that is diverting off of the AMP corridor onto other Correct. streets. And that is a separate study that is, that is underway now. Um, that has been in that's another one that's in draft form uh, that is there's a different effort altogether but it is currently but under it development. is part of NEPA yeah. <clears throat> any other questions on the traffic for uh, Najme or Jeff or Steve I, I just wanted to add a little bit more about what we thought about the project as the consultant team we think it's a very worthwhile project what you're creating for the city is flexible capacity that you cannot get in any other design. If you just have a highway design, the roadway will eventually get plugged up anyway. Whereas now when we, we provide a BRT, you actually end up with a flexible section where you can increase capacity by just increasing, adding more buses. So you could go to 13,000 people a day, 20,000 people a day, so it's a very flexible thing that can can react to the growth of Nashville. So this is a really, really worthwhile project that you cannot get just by um, doing another widening project. You know, you just can't build yourself out of these confined corridors. And so really it's a project that's looking forward that I think is very important to be considered as this moves ahead. Any other questions or comments? on the traffic specifically if not we're going to move to the um, the next topic on our agenda which is the uh, west nashville route review all right um the west end section i know we don't have the uh the slide up here but uh we've touched on it a number of times throughout uh, our meetings and again, the big piece here that we're still working out is just where to put the um, curbside stations. As we yeah. all recall, the, um, the, the section Steve, from- Steve, just a question. So the slides and stuff, do you have those up or can we- When he shut the lid, it just shut up. We have two slides. Can you turn it back on for us anyway? Yeah, that's it. Coming up, Bert. Thank you. Okay, as we mentioned before, um, even a month ago, the, the big question now is um, we've, we've taken the uh, West Nashville section and we've made it a mixed flow where the uh, buses will be running in mixed flow along the curb. And uh, there's two stations. And uh, moving forward, we're going to uh, be scheduling some meetings to begin fleshing out just where they should go. So that's, that's where we're at now. Um, we have modeled that section accurately according to the current plan. So that's all in. But what we want to do is, um, again, meet with the community and begin to flesh out the issues of where exactly those could go and what that means for the various neighborhoods. And we're working on scheduling those. And um, also, there's a, uh, in March, we had a design issue meeting that uh, we were able to get some feedback, so. 
that's a, a question. I when you say you're going to schedule meetings, how do you do? You, is that a public notice meeting, or is this one of those things y'all did in the past of this kind of private private invitation? Well, what we're trying to do is talk about design issues. Um, what, what's occurred, to my understanding, is we've we've asked different council people to determine what who who needs to attend or should be there, and that we will begin talking about that. I know that there's changes in that, and uh, the meeting may become larger in, the, in West Nashville, but uh, again, is, we're is working on no, schedule. Is there a reason that we don't have public meetings with public notice so that uh, all the people in the community can, can attend to see what's going on? Often let, in let, let me interrupt. I, you may not have seen them, but MTA does public notice for all its meetings. Uh, it complies legally with every requirement. Um, and, and the beauty of this, I'll talk more about it later, the beauty of this is now people are paying attention. The fact that people didn't pay attention is uh, uh, a little different story. Well, actually, I had to <clears throat> request to be admitted to a meeting tonight that is clearly doesn't appear to me to meet the public standard, and Ms. McCall was nice enough to admit me and perhaps individuals, but that's not meeting the requirements of a public meeting. Let, uh, let me try to address that. Uh, what we were trying to do with these meetings was a... Uh, yeah, you're going to need to speak. Okay. Can you hear me now? Much what, better. What we were trying to do with these meetings was a process similar to what we described to you that we did in East Nashville. Now we, we needed some initial uh, feedback from the people that were most affected. And so we held a small meeting. We didn't consider it a public meeting, but it was open to anybody that wanted to come. If that system, and you seem to be comfortable with it when we described it in East Nashville, if that doesn't satisfy what you would like, we'll do something different. But we thought for a larger meeting, it would be good to get some initial feedback from the people most affected. And again, Diane, if you want to come, or Richard, or anybody else, that's fine. We don't necessarily, we have lots of meetings. We don't notice every meeting that we have. There are times when we have official, formal, public meetings. There's a distinction. There's, I'm not gonna quibble with you about anything what Lewis said or what you just said. There are public meetings. But just let's just focus on tonight. Um, I live we, less than two tenths from yeah, we're gonna that location, well, well, and I wasn't invited, nor was there a notice that would have allowed me to respond. Right, and we worked with the two council persons and asked them for advice on who we should draw at this first meeting. And we're going to postpone that meeting, and we'll we'll do a larger group if that's what you all would like. Thank well, you. Just out of curiosity, where was this meeting being held? Because I live over there too, and I didn't know anything about it. In fact, I live on a street that's somewhat impacted uh, okay. by, by this. Again, by, by the whole I, I, thing. Richard, we, 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 we could argue this for a long time, but yeah. there, are, there are different kinds of meetings. Sometime MTA or Public Works or somebody will meet with one landowner about one problem, um, and it doesn't affect everybody four miles around. Um, other times, there needs to be a, a publicly given, publicly announced public meeting, and I think those are just different kinds of meetings. But the purpose of tonight's meeting, Lewis, was to determine the location and the utility of the, um, whatever you're calling it, park and ride or availability of the station or Delmington Park. That's what was, that's what um, was eventually sent to me. I have a question and a little concern about the west side. Uh, two meetings ago, uh, the station location or a so-called holding place was discussed, but as of right now, we are conclude in about a few minutes in here. And we still don't have station location determined. Um, so how I'm thinking maybe pretty soon Chairman Matthews will ask us if we come to consensus. And I have a problem not knowing where the stations will go. How could we come to consensus, much less to be able to recommend to the mayor? Uh, any suggestions? Minna, and yeah, if you can answer that and flip up the route map also two slides back so we can all be looking at the same thing. So there's, there's our map. Moving forward, 
we're going to have to again have have meetings with the local neighborhoods to determine exactly. You're going to need to talk into a microphone. Mo moving forward in the design, we're going to have to have more meetings. The, where they specifically go has not been finalized. But we can agree upon this section is going to be mixed flow. It's going to be curb running. It's going to be curbside stations. We've the current locations are approximately where they were almost a year ago with the center running. We just moved them to the nearest intersection. But we're going to have to have a lot more discussion to figure out exactly where they go and why that's the best. And so we're going to be trying to get input from the community as to where that is. These are by no means final at all. These are just a starting point. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, I suppose. Thank you. OK. Other questions on the um, on the West Nashville section. So, Mina, I think that what the conversation that you and Steve just had really put this into um, a really clear, at least for me, understanding of where the the West Corridor is. Let me see if I can just state that for everybody here. So there, in terms of where we are from a committee perspective, or what's been drawn, is it's mixed flow, it is curbside running, and the stations are curbside. So it's a lot like, um, so those, those are the three characteristics that, that we know. The, char the things that we don't know are the, the uh, location of the stations and the location and the operation of the uh, park and ride lots. Are there other things, committee, Steve, Mark, that we, that we need to know? So to me, um, you know, the, the question, and I invite anybody's comment, we're talking about um, doing this mixed flow, so it's not in dedicated lanes. One issue that I know, Richard, a, a, a variety of my neighbors out there also had, um, had concern about. We have curbside um, stations, not in the middle, and the issues really now are, are parking and where, um, what if any stations that we have in there. Hey, Bert, I'd just like to add, we're going to continue to work with parks on Elmington Park, so you can add that. So any, any comments, any questions, any things that we need to add to that, Richard? When you say you're going to work with the Parks Department, what do you, what do you mean you're going to work with the Parks Department? Take more green space for more parking? You're going to park? No, we're, not, we're not taking any more green space. But Are you going to take? How we're going to stripe the parking lot, we need to talk about with them more. How we're going to designate spots for BRT versus uh, the residents. Um, there's also a request for some parking along Elmington. And how that the actual details of how that works out, we need to work with with Parks on that as well. Well, I would also suggest if you're going to park on Elmington, that you work with the school board because that's where all of the cars that line up to pick the kids park. Well, you know, and you can't have parking on Elmington when you have school in session because those parents have no place to park the car to pick up their kids. Diane. Well, a, a question for clarity. Um, back to Min is saying at some point you may start talking about that consensus thing. Heading that way. On the original agenda that we were given, the last meeting was going to be devoted to a discussion of ridership um, and a discussion of financing. Um, it appears that we're not going to take those up. And um, I, I do think ridership impacts the questions that we are discussing now with regards to the stations. Um, so if those are to be taken up uh, outside of the committee's activity, I would like to know, why didn't we get there? Well, first off, on the ridership, um, the ridership 
that has already been provided for the project is, is adequate for FTA to move us into the, their grant program. So the ridership is good to get us there. Um, it's a conservative approach, but it's gotten us into the grant program. Yes, we're going to revisit that. We have not done an updated ridership projection, but at the same time, I think there's also some more service planning that needs to happen. So when the service planning gets updated, the ridership can also get updated. So again, that's a piece that can be addressed so as we move So just along. to be clear, when you say what you mean is the original ridership figures, what, from 2012, got us into project development? Uh, but, you're gonna re but you are going to revisit ridership now that the yes, route yes, has been substantially changed. Yeah, I mean, it's based on the MPO's model. The MPO's model is being updated. So there's a, a, other things going on at the same time. But what, what you need to understand is what's been done is acceptable to the Federal Transit Authority. If they didn't like it, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have the grants. We wouldn't be on the president's uh, uh, proposed budget, all those kinds of things. So what's been done has been accepted already. We're going to revisit those because we need to update those. But we want to update it on the most recent service plan for the corridor. And we're just not there right now. I know you're not happy with the answer, but that's kind of where we are. So what I'd love to do is, if I can, because we've got two things that I want to get done. One is to just, so the statement that Minna, Steve, and I have talked about in terms of where, where the committee is as it relates to our understanding of the West Nashville route is that um, we are, let me see if I can say this, we're, we're comfortable with the uh, mixed flow, the curbside running, uh, and the curbside stations. We would like further clarification or need uh, additional uh, detail on the park and ride lots located as they are and the station locations. This all within the um, general comment and concern which has been for each of the issues that's out there related to ridership and, and funding. Is that a statement that the committee would agree with? I'd like to echo Richard's point about park and ride and, and the uh, concern about after school pickup. I just think that ought to be something we consider more carefully. And maybe as a specific addition to the list that I've just given that we take that in, we ask them to take that into um, specific. Is there, I'm, I'm asking if there's any objections to that. Is that a statement that we would agree to all? I'm assuming I'm taking that with no comment that we are, and then I would like to, Mary. Um, Chairman, yeah, I just wanted to ask a question to Steve. I am concerned about, you know, now these are uh, curbside running. Is Can you talk a little bit about then, um, so one thing is that I thought with the dedicated lanes, the advantage is uh, emergency vehicles can use those lanes then and say, you know, God forbid your loved one is in an emergency when second counts and you're trying to get to uh, St. Thomas. Um, so the idea is that, you know, they would be able to hop in those dedicated lanes now without that um, uh, you know the congestion it, it does concern me uh, emergency vehicles would operate like they do today they would just go in in the mixed flow that would be in that part of the, the road okay thank you I just think uh, this committee should you know acknowledge that there is that uh, safety issue I mean one thing that the dedicated lanes did provide is is that type Steve, Thank you. what about uh, emergency vehicles where the amp is in the center of the road? Uh, emergency vehicles will be allowed to use the bus lane. So they won't have to cross over the center aisle? They wouldn't have to cross over. And they would have to make a U-turn at a traffic light if they were going back and couldn't make a Well, if turn. they had to, most emergency vehicles can go most, most any most places. Over now, the four-inch curb and down right. the four now, inches as we on the get other near, side. Like hospitals, <laughs> mm -hmm. as we get near hospitals, we'll make sure that their access is completely unhindered. 
You know, I mean, we would make sure that ambulances have direct access. There'd be no, uh, uh, the, the small medians that we do have, those wouldn't be there at those kinds of intersections. So at, at the emergency room locations, those would, would, would not be there so that they could, you know, access in and out quickly. But along the corridor itself, and even in any city, fire trucks and ambulances can m move about wherever they need to to get to uh, service uh, people in need. I hope that helps. What I would love to do now is, we've talked about the West Nashville route, we've kind of have a statement. What I would love to do, each of us has, has been sitting here for a lot. I know that there's a lot on everybody's uh, mind. And what I would like to do now, if we could, is to start the process of each of us having whatever statement we would like to, um, to make. What I, uh, my suggestion is that we start with uh, Joe Barker and then just come all the way around uh, and finish up with, uh, with Ben. Is that Bert, all right? Bert, I'll try Joe. to be brief. You know, the first thing is I respect everybody's views that's on this committee or in the city. Uh, I don't purport to be an expert on transportation. Uh, I am an urbanist. Uh, my company's developed the Gulch. Um, I think parking needs to be a very important component of this transportation system that we're considering. I think it least needs to be looked at uh, and from the standpoint of much, much more robust, something that can continue to preserve green space. Uh, we see this all the time in larger urban areas. Uh, simply you have to go, go underground and build your parking. Uh, but quality public transportation is essential for any great city, and I think Nashville can become a great city. Um, I respect uh, those people who seem to be opposed to the AMP project as it exists. Uh, but you know, I look back to things that were going on in Nashville's transportation system 50, 60 years ago when uh, a group of our citizens insisted on the fact that they be given equal treatment uh, in our transportation system. I think today our transportation system may be in as much of a crisis. I look at it not just from the standpoint of the AMP, I look at it from the standpoint of a community-wide transportation system that we have to have to be able to take care of everybody from Bordeaux to Nolensville to all across the community. Um, and and there, is no, there is no easy answer. We need to begin somewhere. And I guess I'm, I'm relying upon what I've been doing in the Gulch for the last 20 years, and that is we started. We made some mistakes. I'm sure there's mistakes in what these fine engineers have suggested. But, you know, if you keep moving forward uh, and, and keep responding to the community's needs, I think, you can, I think you can make a very successful project. And I don't just mean an AMP project. I mean a transportation system. I'm glad today that some of the grandiose plans that we had in the Gulch didn't work. Uh, frankly, it would have been terrible to come in and just build Disneyland there. Uh, we've responded to what the community wanted. We've tried to do it. I think it's been good for the Gulch, but I think it's been good for Nashville. I think there's a parallel that can happen with the transportation system. Um, I don't want to go on and on. I simply have to say that I do support the AMP project. Uh, again, I respect the views of other people. I want them to be heard, uh, but I do believe that we need to go forward with it. Uh, we need to broaden it. We need to expand it. Uh, we need to give it encouragement. And you know, in a situation in which uh, public infrastructure spending has, as a percentage of GDP has been dropping so rapidly, I think we have to embrace the efforts of our mayor to bring federal funds to Nashville and to utilize them in such a such a very, very good way. So that's my position. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, there's been an attempt to get us to reach a consensus on details of the AMP plan, such as where the bus stops uh, and where the bus turns, but there's been no substantive discussion on whether the AMP plan is the right overall plan for our city. It's like a family discussing window treatments and paint colors of a new house and not discussing if the new house is affordable or if it meets the needs of the family or is in the best use of the family's resources. In my opinion, a mass public transportation system for a community must first meet the transportation needs of those citizens who must rely on public transportation. 
it must efficiently and affordably get those citizens from their homes to their jobs, to grocery and shopping areas, to doctors and hospitals, and to schools. The public transportation system must do this with frequent rides 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Once that system is in place, many other citizens will choose to frequently and ultimately completely use public transportation, leaving their cars at home, with some choosing not to even own a car. The reason that public transportation works well in New York City and areas in Europe and Asia is because those areas have huge population density and high ridership that makes the system more financially practical. Because our relatively small population is spread out over such a large area, our system is not as affordable. In trying to serve everyone, we have many bus routes with very low ridership that are very costly. In order to save money, we cut back on frequency of service and even discontinue service for long periods during the night. That fails the mission of providing reliable public transit to those who rely on it for late night jobs, entertainment, and emergencies. So what's the solution for Nashville's public transportation system? A 20 year plan coordinated with a planning and zoning, with planning and zoning to lay out a route system that may only cover one half of the current system but which provides a commitment of excellent bus service every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Businesses, apartments, condominiums, schools, churches, hospitals who want to cater to citizens who need or choose to use public transportation would be encouraged to locate on or near that new route system. 20 years is ample time for our community to adjust to the new system and 20 years will be here before we know it. In fact, as a board member of the MTA, I made this suggestion to them 30 years ago. It fell on deaf ears. If they had listened, I think today we would have 10 to 20% fewer cars on the road and no one would be complaining about traffic. This plan would cost almost nothing to implement and if we do, I think other cities will follow our lead. I believe we need to get the basics of public transit right before we implement a costly $175 million plan which will serve very few people in a small area of town where it is unpopular and where I'm convinced it will make traffic worse, not better. Thank you. I, I'm sure all of us know and aware that the only thing that we really have and that we really own is time. And I think that's what we're talking about here. But I also think everybody knows you got to crawl before you can walk. We need some type of transit system. Whether this is the correct one, that's up to each individual here to decide. But I think we need to move forward. This is not the solution, but it's a solution to our transit problem. I, for those of you who are concerned about uh, displacements or inconvenience, I, I just remind you, and most of you in here were, were not here, didn't, don't know about it, what I-40 did to North Nashville. I mean, it tore up everything. We have no economic development out there now that's worth anything, and we did at that time. Now, I-40 didn't do all of it, and I won't go into the rest of what happened to it. But I think we just need to move forward with this program. It's the only one we've got. It's the only one that FTA and TDOT has approved. So what else we do later, uh, some of you will be here to see it, and I hope some of you will be here to see AMPS if it started. I, I'm reminded of, of my military career. Uh, I was an operations sergeant in a field artillery battalion, and we did a thing called time and space. And maybe some of you who are in the military and can, can agree or understand what I'm talking about. We did march tables. I was stationed at Friedberg, Bad Nauheim, Germany, and every year we went to Grafenbeer. We had over 150 vehicles. We had a starting point. We had a space between vehicles. We know the speed of the vehicles. 
This scientific stuff doesn't tell you that. We could tell you with our march tables when those vehicles reached certain points because we had a starting point and we had an end point for each battery that came through that thing. So we can't do that here. If we could start at 30 miles an hour from St. Thomas Hospital and space every vehicle 50 yards apart, we could figure out what time you got to 12th Avenue. You can't do that here now. So I, I would just suggest and hope that that, that those, uh, and, and I'm like Joe, and I respect those who may see a different way of doing this thing. But it, I, I, as I recall, when I was on the Planning Commission 20 years ago, the traffic uh, the service in Nashville was a, was a D, and I think it's still a D. So we need to change that, and the folks here can do it, and let's move forward, and let's do something to get this traffic congestion down. Uh, Lee, I, I agree with you 20 years ago, they didn't listen to you, but hey, 20 years ago, we didn't have all of the folks we got here now to deal with. And uh, you ought to be selling a lot of cars. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much, and I appreciate being a member of this committee. Whether it's a simple plan or whether it's a complex plan, like these good people have presented, we need a plan, and AMP is not it. We need, we need an efficient mass transit plan, something that's not as complicated and not as economically unfeasible as AMP. I think we've got a vision, but what we need is a real plan. First of all, I am so thankful to be a part of the committee. This has been really eye-opening. Um, I, first of all, am completely in favor of the proposed route. My eyes were open to the struggles of people in East Nashville trying to get over to this side of town during our 200 days of events that we have downtown. Um, and I know that we always need to be doing things that connect one section of the city to another, like the 28th Avenue connector. That was wonderful. I'm not convinced that the time that is saved by building the AMP is the best transit plan. I really am not. I've got coworkers that are telling me that they have one and a half to two hour commutes to get into Nashville, and I see that as a higher priority. I've spent the last seven months encouraging and educating individuals on how to ride the bus. I think it's the best way to get people excited about mass transit. I've tried to teach people how to use the seven, the three, and the five. And they're really surprised. They're surprised at how um, helpful the bus, ri bus drivers are, the ease it is it, they have to get on the bus, how clean the buses are. And they realize, this is my own time once you get on the bus. But the number one complaint that they have is real-time notification. They want to know when they get to the stop after I get them down to wherever they are, when is the bus going to pick me up? How Have I missed it? Did it come early? Do I have enough time to walk to the next stop? Sure, the AMP will control that, but we have, we have time right now. The technology is here to let people know those sorts of things. And we as a city should be able to afford real-time notification at a vast mo number of our bus stops. Um, I, and I also think maps should be added to the routes, and, and, on, and we can start on, the, on Broadway. You know, my husband, he says, tofu is tofu. And the amp is still a bus. And even when we dress it up, it's still going to be a bus. And we're going to need to convince people to ride it. And so I believe a curbside or one lane out designated deck direction peak hour bus lanes that include everything that we've learned about, about you know prepaid board, boarding, limited transit stops, transit signal priority, real time notification, and no on-street parking so that we have those but that bus lane, I think that would be a better use of our resources. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with 25,000 employees and 13,000 undergraduate and graduate students and thousands of visitors daily, Vanderbilt has been a longtime proponent of more mass transit in Nashville and has supported those efforts. Our faculty, staff, and students care very much about this topic. One of our most popular benefits that we offer to employees has become our partnership with MTA that allows our faculty and staff to ride to and from work free of charge and paid by Vanderbilt. We have gone from 225 daily rides in 2004 to more than 2,050 daily rides currently. 
Our university constantly recruits student, faculty, and staff from all over the country and around the world. And many of these come from cities that have robust transit systems. And they want the same here and are often surprised, and if not frustrated, at the lack of transit options currently in Nashville. Like Nashville itself, Vanderbilt's campus has a limit to the number of vehicles it can accommodate. We encourage people to find alternative transportation <laughs> options because fewer cars on our campus means a better experience for everyone. Vanderbilt supports the AMP, though, per, per, though perhaps not perfect, as an important service for our university and our city. And we believe that it will be a successful first leg of a larger transit system. I've been privileged to be a part of this process. I think it's been a good one. I respect every member of this committee. And Bert, I think you deserve a, a debt of gratitude from all of us for taking on um, chairing this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm going to ask you just to, to kind of imagine that none of these meetings have happened. And I'm an out-of-town consultant that has come to town to tell you how to do bus rapid transit. And here's my plan. We're going to start at Five Points by East Nashville High School. And we're going to have curbside service. And then we're going to take that bus and we're going to maneuver it to the center lane. Oh, it can't be in the middle of the road there because there's been a building built there and I thought we could acquire that uh, right away for virtually nothing. But there's, So we're going to change that. It's just going to be one lane for the first block because we can't acquire the, the, the right of way needed. And then we're going to go down the middle of the lane of Main Street for three blocks and we're going to get to Fifth Street. And on Fifth Street we're going to turn left and uh, we're going to go to Woodland. Then we're going to get to Woodland Street and we're going to turn right. And then we're going to stop at LP Field, or at least close to LP Field, so people that want to walk to the bus stop can get on. Then we're going to go across the Woodland Street Bridge and we're going to lean to the left and get to Union Street. Once we're at Union Street, and we're going to go drive to 3rd Avenue, get to 3rd Avenue, turn right, go across James Robertson Parkway to Gay Street, turn back left on Gay Street, go to the next red light, cross back across James Robertson Parkway, turn left on 4th Avenue, and turn right into the transit center. We're going to load up the people at the transit center. We're going to go back out of the transit center. We're going to turn right on 4th Avenue and go to Commerce Street. Once we're at Commerce Street, we're going to turn right on Commerce Street. We're going to go to 8th Avenue. We're going to turn left on 8th Avenue. And then we get to Broadway. We're somehow going to turn right on Broadway and get in the middle lane on Broadway. And we're going to go about four blocks in the middle of the street. And then once we get to the 12th Avenue, we have to somehow maneuver that bus out of the middle lane, back into traffic, and we're going to go to 17th Avenue, which way we've got to weave back across traffic to get in the center lane and go from 17th Avenue to 31st Avenue. And once we get to 31st Avenue, we have to maneuver back across traffic to get to curbside service. Whoa. And this is BRT. That's the most circuitous route I've ever heard of in my entire life. There has got to be a better way. I am a proponent of mass transit, and I've stated that for now a year. But I'm also a proponent of a plan that works, a comprehensive plan for the region, one that provides community input a plan that is for the future, a plan that uses tomorrow's technology to solve yesterday's problems, not yesterday's technology to solve tomorrow's problems, a plan that is funded and an implementation plan of when it will be done and what will be done. That's what I am for. And I think the AMP, if built, could be such a disaster that it will set any movement towards mass transit in this community back decades. And I want to see the first thing we do be something that is positive and does work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I've got to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to first thank Mr. Matthews. I think you've done a great job at trying to steward us through uh, 
you know, arguably one of the, the most contentious things that I've seen probably since uh, the NFL Yes campaign uh, that went here in Nashville. And, um, and I think there's a similar parallel that could be drawn to that. Um, it was very divisive, uh, that situation was. For those of you that were in Nashville, and myself being born and raised here, um, I've spent 41 years here watching it evolve. And, you know, looking at the NFL, yes, there was a campaign that, that tried to offset, uh, honestly, a lot of the older residents uh, in Nashville that thought, ah, spending taxpayer dollars on an NFL team, you know, it, it, we're not going to get a return on our investment. I think over time that, that argument has, uh, even though they're not playing very well right now, uh, I think economically I think it was the right thing to do. Um, and it was forward thinking by our mayor at that time. Um, I, I feel somewhat sorry for Steve and Mark in this situation because one of the ongoing comments has always been, well, that's not in the scope of work, uh, of our work or in this project. And one of my first questions at either the first meeting or the second meeting, I took this approach as when I sit in my restaurants and bars in town, everybody, you know, is a taxpayer, whether they're really paying taxes or not, by God, they're paying it. And when your name gets put in the paper, they want to know what you're going to spend their money on. And I don't know if that's how it's been for the other members, but from the bar chatter, I don't think that there's been a good communication of that this is tied to a regional plan. It's not tied to a regional plan. We've kind of gotten it, it is and it isn't. And, and you guys have just kind of been a bullseye for all of us, um, uh, you know, but that's what you're paid to do. So you got to take it. Uh, my question at the beginning was looking at it from an economic standpoint, and I put my business owner's hat on because I do pay a lot of taxes in this town. And where the rubber meets the road at the end of the day is this is a lot of money. You know, whether the feds are kicking it into us or not, and that's, you know, hell, they hadn't already passed a budget up there recently. So I don't know if we'll ever see that money. In the meantime, I think that this has done a great service to the community to recognize, and if you don't recognize it, you've got your head in the sand, that Nashville is experiencing unprecedented growth. I think everyone would realize that. Uh, we're on the cover of every magazine, international and nationally, uh, but we're on a collision course, and our traffic will eventually shut off that flow of growth. Now, is the AMP the correct solution to that? I don't know. I, I would give it an incomplete at this time. Um, I think that based on the route, if this is the only route that this city can ever look at, does y'all's engineering project pass the mustard? Yeah, it probably does. But it's, it's tough for me to say that this is the only thing that we need to be looking at. And, and that's the consensus I get from Nashvillians is this is a Band-Aid on a mortal wound right now. And that's no fault to the engineering team or any of our members. And, and I echo a lot of what has already been said. Uh, so with the respect of time, I'll just wrap it up by saying, you know, if Nashville's going to continue to try to keep up with its pace, at some point we're going to have to bite the bullet. And, and I don't think that this solves it all. So I'm cautiously optimistic that as it goes further and more of your studies come through, it's unfortunate that we still have studies out there that are really important, specific to ridership. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, that's it. See ya. Well, I did not uh, make any statement, so I try not to mumble. It has been a great experience. I mean, I learned quite a bit. I really want to thank uh, Chairman Matthews for his patience and thank uh, Mark, Steve, Jeff, and Najme, you know, all the engineering team. You educated me quite a bit. And unfortunately, I wanted to have some finished product this day. And so, hey, Mr. Mayor, this is what we think. This is what we should, we ought to do. But after six months, I do have more questions than answers. 
And if we keep continue this uh, committee meeting another year or year and a half, I'm sure we will have great product. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, we don't have time. But uh, we did raise uh, quite uh, awareness. I think now many people in the Nashville, if you say AMP, uh, six months ago, they will say, what, the music equipment? Now people say amp. They know either pro or you know not. So we did a really great job for raising awareness. So I am uh, cautiously optimistic we can come up with something, great thing for the city of Nashville. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I, I want to thank uh, a number of people. Uh, I want to thank Bert Matthews for, uh, for patience and for leadership. Um, I want to thank Lee Beeman for mentioning uh, the, the plan idea 20 years ago. Um, the, the saying about when's the best time to plant a tree uh, 20 years ago, when's the second best time today, um, it's time to do a plan. Uh, and I see Steve Bland in the back, and um, the MTA is going to do a plan with a number of other agencies involved. Um, and whatever happens to AMP uh, is really a sidebar on that. It's time for a community plan, and I think we're going to do it. And, and uh, Lee, I hope we do it right, and, and uh, it'd be nice if, if you and others around here could be part of that. Third thank you, frankly, is to the folks who have done all the applauding so far. Um, because for a long time, MTA was out there running a transit system, and nobody knew about it, and nobody paid any attention to it, and nobody cared much about it. Um, and Bert was on it, uh, on the board, and Lee was on the board, and others were on the board. Um, and so the, 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 uh, the discussion that we've had in this community for the last year is really helpful and really beneficial, and really Really changes transit to be some from something that was kind of a secret um, and frankly only for those who uh, who kind of had to use it um, to uh, I hope uh, a system that's for everybody um, that's used uh, dramatically and well in, in the future um, and then finally um, I, I just want to say that um, I, I've heard somebody say, well, we're getting the federal money, so we ought to use it. Um, I'm not sure that's right. Uh, I, think we ought to, I think we ought to do AMP if it's the right thing to do, and if there's something better, we ought to figure out something better. And so I, th I think, uh, again, this, this, may, this may surprise you, but my, my wish for the community is that we not waste being the it city um, and doing other things right, like building a ballpark and an amphitheater and, and a pedestrian bridge and a number of other things that we're doing that are really good things. And I hope as a community in the next year we can figure this out uh, and do it right. And I, and I bet we can, uh, because like with English only and like with the uh, Titans, uh, we usually do it right. So, uh, that's, so that's my hope for the city. Well, I too want to start by, by, by thanking uh, Bert for his leadership on the committee. Um, and all, it had to be worse than hurting cats. It had to be hurting cats scratching at your eyes some of the times. Um, and also want to, uh, want to thank the, uh, the mayor for, for appointing the, this committee. I think it's done an, an important, it's an important step in raising public involvement and public awareness. Uh, I would also uh, very quickly like to say, Laura, good news is that uh, real-time scheduling is on the way. Uh, MTA has a, I'm sure they can provide you more details on that, but I absolutely agree on that. Uh, Several people have mentioned uh, the, the, the MTA's long-range plan, and like Lewis said, uh, that process is getting ready again. I encourage everybody to participate in that. I would mention that BRT uh, and Enhanced BRT are in the existing long-range MTA plan, and they're also in the MPO plan, the regional plan for the entire uh, Nashville greater area. So this isn't the first time this has been brought up. It's not a new thing. It's seen as an integral part of that plan, the spine of that plan, and I think it's important that, that we move forward with that. But I, I encourage people to participate in that, in that planning commission, that planning process, both at the MTA and the MPO as it moves forward. Um, I would say the most important thing I've learned as part of this process is how much compromise goes into a project of this size. Uh, some of that compromise is political, not all of which I agree with, but I see the reason why that compromise was made. And some of it's physical, uh, the, the requirements of the route, the limitations of the route. I think we all know the route quite well now after Richard walked us through it from end to end. Um, so. Uh, and all those compromises aside, though, I still support the AMP, uh, and I support it primarily for two overlapping reasons. One is the improvements to quality of life it will give us uh, from just the options for, for ridership, uh, the, uh, 
so you, you, you have the choice of driving a car or, or, or taking the bus. I take the bus two or three days a week now. I don't have to take the bus, but I find it convenient uh, on some days when it fits my schedule. And I like having the choice between the local bus that's, that lets me off 100 feet from my house and the BRT light where I, I, you know, I might have to walk a half mile, but the schedule may work better on some days. So I think those kinds of options are important for a community, a community like Nashville that's trying to, to rise itself to the next level. And that's the other aspect of this is the, the economic development aspect of it, whether it being supporting tourism or be it attracting those the young talent. I think we, I don't want to steal any of uh, Schultz's uh, thunder here, but you know the, the surveys I think we've all seen in the last week saying how one of the main factors that to attract and keep the, the young talent that we need to be that dynamic economy, one of their main factors is, is quality public transit and having those types of options. And I'm probably getting close to my time, so I'll stop there. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I have said on any number of public occasions that I think the mayor deserves our applause and support for having started the first major discussion about transit in Nashville in years. Having said that, the Citizens Advisory Committee was created in April for the sole purpose of diffusing the time bomb that has plagued this project from its inception, and that's lack of public involvement. As has been said much more eloquently before me, um, what we have here is a plan that clearly has the best of intentions, but it's cut and paste. It is not a comprehensive plan, and we still do not know with any sort of affirmation that this is the best alternative for various reasons, questions left unanswered, but most importantly because two key issues, ridership and financing, were tabled and were not before this committee. The committee has been a wonderful group of people, many of whom I have met for the first time and enjoyed very much learning your comments and your positions, and I I'm grateful for that. I too have to say, Bert, you've done a masterful job under frequently very difficult circumstances. But the committee is not an adequate representation for the public who reside in all sectors of the county. So let's keep this in mind as we do move forward. I look forward to the MTA's long range plan. I think that component has been missing and it's key. At no point throughout this committee's service, has any person demonstrated a compelling need for, bus rapid, for a bus system running on dedicated lanes in the middle of the east-west corridor, or how this impacts the region? We now know, after the traffic analysis, that the AMP will do nothing to ease traffic congestion, as we heard in the September briefing where the engineers told us that no one currently traveling by private vehicle would switch to the AMP. The committee's request to see alternatives to the removal of two to three lanes from the corridor have never been considered, much less answered, which is so critical considering Mr. Goudreau and his firm's fine efforts on curbside service over a much longer route that was launched recently in Grand Rapids at a total capital cost of $37 million, as opposed to the $175 million that we have heard about. The committee has been assured that the FTA would like to grant some money to Nashville, and I have no doubt that that is the case. But that is also, I feel certain, without regard to the viability of the plan or any regard for whether our city can continue to subsidize basic services if we take on this kind of capital cost and the enormous subsidies required to maintain and operate it. It should be somewhat questionable for local officials that after all the money that has been spent on marketing this project to us, touting benefits which this committee now has learned cannot be achieved, that the AMP is really nothing more than an example of the federal government dictating transit solutions to cities, which are not only not viable, but will impose a financial burden without taxpayer participation. Thank you, Diane, for being a hard act to follow. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to try not to take my whole three minutes. I just want to say, as an architect, we, we have a, a joke in our profession about design by committee, which, uh, you know, you can imagine the sculpture or the building or whatever, where the, you know, the, everybody gets a little bit of a say and you put it together and it looks like a quilt where none of the fabrics match. Um, and I felt a lot like we had some of that going on for the last six months in here, and it was difficult at times. But I just have to say, today has been the best committee meeting, I think, because everyone's gotten to make a strong statement, and I've agreed with 99% of what was said. Uh, I think that there is consensus, true consensus, that our transit system needs a vast improvement. Everyone is saying that for the benefit, the economic benefit of our community. And so if we continue to look forward and push for improvements, we'll be fine. And I'll cut it right there. Yeah, you're the last one. Then we're going to take a break. The mayor's here and wants to make a statement. Then we'll finish up the we'll rest of our game. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, I do want to say thanks to the mayor for convening this group. I think the discussion has been great, and it has provided a lot of education across the community. I want to say thanks to Bert. I think generally Bert has kept us on route um, on this throughout this uh, this process. Also, want to say thanks to the MTA staff because uh, you've been responsive through this whole process. We've seen the design change. As, as you have met with us, we've gotten answers to questions. I know you'll be delivering uh, other answers as well. A couple of quick uh, comments about this partic our particular work, which I viewed really as the opportunity to provide feedback on the idea of the AMP as it was being developed. First of all, it's not everything I wish it could be, but it is, it's certainly a better design from a community perspective. And it still retains the ability to provide convenient, dependable, rapid, comfortable transit, safe transit for people who want to rely on it as a primary source. Agree completely that it needs to be part of that larger context in that regional context and great to hear the MTA and RTA are embarking on the process to create uh, that plan. Um, the CAC has improved the process. They have improved the route. They have improved uh, the usage. And it's been great to be a part of that. Public input's been a part of this process from the beginning, even before this group, but particularly uh, as this group has met. and. As, you, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the very existence of this group has created more education and exposure uh, to the need for transit in this community. From a business perspective, the issue of transit is one that the city must address because when we think about prosperity and creating prosperity and the growth of jobs and the growth of jobs and the attraction of people, we know the future workforce needs this as an alternative. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Trisha, if I could wait, uh, the rest of y'all that are here, if we really want to hear what you have to say, I'd like to introduce uh, right now, though, uh, the person who called us all to uh, meet Mayor Carl Dean. Well, thank you for that uh, kind reception after a couple hours of uh, meeting. I, I don't know what, uh, whether you regret having accepted the appointment or not. But thank you for, uh, thank you for doing this, and um, thank you for all your hard work. Let me just start by thanking Bert. I want to give Bert really my heartfelt thanks for agreeing to chair this committee. Um, Bert volunteered an enormous amount of time and energy to do this work, and his commitment guaranteed that this was, I believe, a productive experience. Uh, for that, I'm extremely grateful. I also want to thank each member of uh, the Citizens Advisory Committee for agreeing to be involved in this endeavor. Uh, you've uh, helped elevate the conversation uh, around mass transit in Nashville, and that is one of, the, one of the most important things that you could do. 
Thank you for raising the level of the discourse. It's a critical conversation for the future, not only of Nashville, but of our entire region. We appreciate your time and your efforts to help provide input on one of the most critical issues facing our city today. You know, here in the South, the trend has been for cities to spread out as they grow. Our populations have grown during an era where the personal automobile uh, was dominant, and so we have been less reliant on transit. With the trend of more people moving into the city and commuting into cities, we have to accept that transit is going to be an essential part of our future. The Nashville region alone, as you have heard uh, me say before, is expected to grow by one million new residents by 2035. But we won't and we don't have 20 years to see the impact that that's going to have, and we don't have 20 years uh, to deal with this issue. For example, uh, last fiscal year, this just in terms of the growth here, was Nashville's highest year on record in new construction spending based on building permits issued by our codes department. This year is already tracking ahead of last year. Most of our growth is coming from infill development, and that means there are more cars on congested streets. We need more robust mass transit systems in Nashville and in all the big cities in Tennessee, and if we're gonna remain the economic driver uh, for this state. Our suburban neighbors in the region are increasingly seeing how difficult it can be to move around, something I hear about whenever we meet in the Middle Tennessee Mayor's Caucus. And more and more millennials are choosing mass transit. People born between 1983 and 2000 drive less and use transit more than generations born before them. And Nashville continues to be a place that is extremely attractive to young people. If you read last week's newspapers, whether it's the Times or the Tennessean, there's reference to the fact that we're attracting college graduates as much as almost any city in America. Young people are flocking to our city. They are looking for places to live where driving is an option, not a necessity, according to the national report by the United States Public Interest Research Group. And as they come of age, we'll see more and more demand for an option that doesn't involve driving, an option. Driving will always be here with us, but we need to provide options and choices. Mass transit is directly related to the prosperity of our region. Now is not the time to put on the brakes. Now is the time to move forward and keep this conversation moving. Before I talk about the next steps on the AMP, I want to take a minute to reflect on what's been, uh, what we've achieved with the AMP and what this committee did. After an extensive engineering and engagement process through the alternatives analysis and preliminary engineering, the FTA, um, dependent upon congressional approval, is ready to give us $75 million over time toward the cost of the AMP. That is the largest federal grant award in the history of the city, and it's something we should be proud of. And I have to say that the risk of losing these funds, of losing the opportunity and setting our city back another decade in our quest to, be, to begin advanced mass transit is, is enormous. My point in recounting the extensive work undertaken for this project is that this is the furthest we have come to achieving more reliable mass transit for our city and our region. I'm proud of that achievement, and I'm proud that we formed the Citizens Advisory Committee to continue the conversation around the design of the AMP. At the outset of these meetings, the goal was to provide a forum that allows for, for divergent perspectives so that the project can be informed of those ideas. From your diverse perspectives, we altered portions of the design to make the AMP better by taking into account right-of-way issues in East Nashville, ADA accessibility when it comes to station design, downtown's narrow street so that we shifted the route to have the AMP travel on both 4th and 5th avenues instead of two ways on 5th. You did that. As a community leaders, you all brought us your concerns and your ideas. Those ideas were discussed. You shared your thoughts on design and service options, which was the exact task of this committee. But this committee did something else. The committee truly helped to raise the bar for conversations around transit. Trying to introduce mass transit in a car-dependent population is never an easy conversation. And each month for the last six months that you've all come together, you've had that conversation. Your service is deeply appreciated now. It will be invaluable 10 years from now when the AMP is serving as the backbone of a transit line coming throughout this region. So what is the next uh, step for the AMP? First, our project team is continuing their design work and we'll wrap that up in the coming months. 
As I have said from the very beginning, the federal process controls much of our destiny. Federal environmental impact studies are part of that process and will need to be completed in the next year. The state has its own process as well. We will need to meet TDOT standard requirements and follow new procedures enacted by the state legislature earlier this year. Because of these necessary next steps, we will, be seeking local, we will not be seeking local or state funding for the project this upcoming year. We've known from the beginning that taking a transit project off the ground could take more than a year or two. Um, other cities have, have uh, mass transit take from five to ten years to develop. The immediate next step today is that I'm asking Steve Bland, the new CEO of our Metro Transit Authority, to compile all the input from this committee and incorporate that into an overall design for the AMP. Then, in the coming weeks, I'm asking Steve to report those findings back to me and to the Metro Transit Authority Board so we can better understand the progress that has been made and the next steps for the AMP. I also want to highlight today that as the AMP moves forward, the Metro Transit Authority and the Regional Transit Authority will simultaneously be kicking off their five-year strategic master plan process. While the AMP is one leg of the overall plan, this is an important conversation that requires uh, substantial public participation. Our region's economic prosperity is tied to the quality of, and quality of life is tied to that. Rapid growth without mass transit options will inevitably lead to gridlock. Gridlock and traffic congestion will decrease the quality of life in our region and that will in, invariably affect our prosperity. This is the time to get involved in the regional transit planning vision. So please participate in that process and please attend those regional and local meetings for the MTA and the RTA. The announcements of those meetings will happen in early 2015 and I urge you to participate. We cannot change their city's need for mass transit. We need it today and we will need it even more in five years and 10 years. Our current bus system won't solve our traffic problems and one project on one corridor was never intended to be enough. This is an opportunity. We've never come so far in making transit a reality for Nashville, and we cannot turn back on it. We have to continue the conversation around the AMP while also focusing our attention on regional transit. Thank you again for agreeing to serve on this committee and for your contributions to make the AMP as good for Nashville's neighbors as it is for the FTA. Let's make sure we maintain the level of engagement in this critical issue for our great city, we can't afford to get this wrong. And now I will turn it back to Bert with one last thanks to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We've all sat, uh, and Tricia, I would turn it over to you next for your comment. I think it's really important that we show the respect everybody here has gotten also. So Tricia, it's your, your. Um, yes, it's my turn. Um, hello. A talk about tough acts to follow. <laughs> um, I am from Disability Rights Tennessee, formerly known as Disability Law and Advocacy Center, and we advocate for the legal rights of people with disabilities. Transportation is vitally important to people with disabilities, especially public transportation, and I said that in the beginning of these meetings. It is the glue, that's what I call it, of a person's life that has a disability. We can't function in our society without it. We support the AMP and other projects like it, anything, more transportation options, for, that are accessible in our community is essential for us. And so I want to thank the engineering team for its uh, adherence to all the ADA related issues in the project. There's been a couple of them that kind of thwarted some great things I thought with this project. Um, but at the same time, I feel very confident that people with disabilities in this city will be able, um, if the AMP is, comes around, that they will be able to take that um, without any problem. I feel like that they have addressed those issues for people with me basically clarifying that they were there. I believe I've only had to make one or two actual ADA suggestions. 
um, in the project, and I'm just really thankful for, to them for keeping that uh, front and center as they design this project. I want to let everyone know that I feel it's a privilege to be on this committee, and I've learned a lot myself. I've been involved in transportation for years, um, working on issues of accessible transportation, and I really hope our city does develop an overall cons cons comprehensive plan for accessible transportation and for all, for everyone um, in our city and our region. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to echo some of the comments that have already been made, thanks to uh, Mr. Matthews for his leadership. Uh, I especially would like to extend my thanks to the design team for their professionalism, their expertise, and their tremendous patience uh, in the face of questions and sometimes, unfortunately, accusations. Uh, Ralph talked about the need for us to uh, have a transportation system that meets the needs of people who are moving to Nashville, primarily what we often call millennials. Uh, I was asked to serve on this committee by the AARP of Tennessee, so kind of on the other end of the spectrum. Um, and I would say that I'm one of the youngest members of AARP. Uh, but most of us at some point, uh, growing up in the South, there's going to come a time when we need something other than a car. And I think a lot of the uh, objections that I've heard us voice as a committee have been focused on where we are today and how this particular project may impact us personally. And I would respectfully submit that that is the wrong perspective for this type of project. This is about the future of Nashville, both for people moving here today, for those of us who would like to age in place and be here and be mobile in 30 years. So uh, I certainly support the AMP. Uh, I believe that it is the first step Many have mentioned the need for a regional transportation plan, which is vital. Uh, but particularly with this type of project, if we wait and if we continue to raise issues that really aren't issues uh, in terms of delaying this particular project, we get further and further behind. So I think there is a need. Uh, we're never going to get a perfect project. Uh, I think the AMP makes sense. Uh, it it's hopefully will be the spine, I think, as Mr. Lippard said, of a future transportation system, and I strongly support that. Um, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to, uh, for serving. Um, I have learned a lot from where I started to where I am today. It's been a, a very steep learning curve for me. Um, I do want to say that I think that we need to remember that there are a lot of communities a lot of neighborhoods that are outside of the primary corridor of, of where the AMP is supposed to be geographically located. And as a representative of neighborhoods that need additional transportation, mass transit, um, I'm glad that we have a vision. I don't want to see us mired down in small things that will not really move the city forward. Um, overall, I think it's a good idea, I think it's a good vision, and I would like to see us continue uh, forward movement. Um, as described by Richard, uh, it obviously is not the shortest distance between two points, um, because it doesn't go in a straight line. And I can say that, you know, as a neighborhood member, that is something that if I were to use this mass transit, it's got to respond to. It's got to be able to get me from point A to point B in a short amount of time. Um, and I think that requires a lot more planning. Overall, um, I think we've all learned. I think we've all been able to understand that there's a diverse opinion out there and that we've come to understand that we need to compromise on it. Um, I just hope that we can continue to go forward. Thank you. Can I use this one? Please. All right. Um, good afternoon. Thanks to the chair and the advisory committee and the design team. Um, appreciate the opportunity to participate and serve. It's been a lot of, uh, well, not fun. It's been very informative and interesting to say the least. I've learned a lot. 
I think uh, overall and in summary from my perspective, um, this provides another opportunity, another option for travel. Uh, it can improve travel times for both uh, autos and transit riders. Um, it can reduce uh, the demand, the already uh, high demand for structured parking in the most crowded areas. And I think it should be a component of an overall transit strategy for Nashville. 60 seconds. Bravo. Okay, I would like to um, again thank the chairman as well as the mayor's office um, staff. Uh, special thanks to Courtney Stone for writing the meetings, <laughs> meeting notes, no easy tasks there. And uh, particularly the you know MTA and the consulting team for answering our questions and being uh, transparent and helpful, very helpful throughout the process. I think uh, this committee has been able to raise awareness and that we all agree pretty much unanimously that better transit options are needed in Nashville. And I think we've also learned um, the components of, of BRT and that it can have the benefits of streetcar, including similar ridership numbers uh, at a third of the cost, And it, uh, but it, it's critical for it to have those uh, dedicated lanes. And so I think that's uh, something to remember. And as I mentioned earlier about uh, some of the safety concerns too, is not only you know the buses use that, but emergency vehicles can <coughs> use those as well as Nashville continues to grow and get more congested. Uh, as, uh, Cliff mentioned, but you know, also the the regional plans that do exist. The uh, I know the MTA uh, study from 2009 mentioned that we need more crosstown connections, and this plan has that. Uh, it also mentioned uh, frequency. So I know as we move into this new plan, uh, as the mayor talked about in meetings in January, which I hope to see you all there. Um, and uh, that, you know, we'll be talking about the same thing. We need this frequency. We need this crosstown connection. Living on the east side, I know a lot of East Nashvilleians support it, even going uh, uh, past uh, where it ends now and continuing up Gallatin Road. So I look forward to continuing this discussion and keeping up with our peer cities. Thank you. I, uh, I strongly believe in the need for a mass transit solution that benefits not just Nashville, but the greater Middle Tennessee region as a whole. Our city has been riding what seems to be a, a never-ending wave of momentum, and I believe creating a mass transit solution is a key factor in sustaining that momentum and keeping Nashville an attractive and desirable community for those that live here and for the many more that are projected to move here. That being said, while I am encouraged that Nashville is taking steps to implement a mass transit solution, I feel that the AMP project, as currently planned, has generated more questions than answers to our problem. It was my hope that this committee would challenge the project to get to the answers the community needs, but I feel that there are still too many unknowns and too many debatable projections. For me, it boils down to one major thing, ridership, specifically in West Nashville. We all know that a majority of West Nashville is opposed to this project. I live in West Nashville and I can probably count on one hand the amount of MPS signs I've seen in people's yards. I've also seen plenty of buses running up and down West End with only a handful of passengers. Very few people ride the bus on this corridor now and I just don't see anyone riding the AMP either. I believe that the projected travel time savings on this proposed route are just not enough to justify abandoning the convenience of one's car. Do I think the AMP is a bad idea? No, I think the AMP on West End is a bad idea. I've always believed that a hybrid route that starts on Charlotte Avenue and cuts over to West End and continues along the proposed route as is would be more widely accepted by the neighborhoods it touches and kickstart more economic development along a forgotten corridor that sorely needs it. I'd like to thank Mayor Dean for forming this committee, for Bert for keeping us on track, my fellow members who were giving up their time and their input, and for the transportation engineers and staff for their knowledge and patience. Thank you. I guess one of the benefits of my name starting with V is that I get to go last and get the last word sometimes, so that's great. Um, I read something this morning, it was an article that came out late last week that was talking about things that the middle class can no longer afford, and it was things like college savings for their children, retirement savings and purchasing new vehicles. Uh, the income of a General Motors worker back when my parents were growing up was in today's dollars, $50 an hour. And today the world's largest company, Walmart, they're paying their people $8 an hour. The bottom line is affordability of transportation and accessibility to get to our jobs is an important issue that we need to consider. 
I think obviously all of us know that public transit is an important issue, not only just as an accessibility issue and to attract young, educated people, but also because it's a justice issue. It's something that affects all of us, and especially those of us who are most vulnerable and most in need, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, a few questions that I wanted to think through is, you know, is this, is this a good project or not? Uh, first of all, has the plan been thoroughly evaluated and studied? I'd say the answer is clearly yes. Um, will the AMP have long-term benefit that is measurable and significant? I think the jury's still out, but I think there is significant and measurable improvement. It's just a question of whether that's enough. Um, do we need transit solutions beyond the AMP? Emphatically, yes. Can the AMP serve as a backbone for future transit development in the Nashville area? I think the, there's that, that jury's still out. Is the plan perfect? No. Is the plan paid for? We don't know. Is the plan worthy of further public investment? I think the answer is yes. Thank you, Ben. Thank every one of you for your time, for your uh, focus, for your civility, for your uh, intellectual pursuit of a whole variety of things. I think that I can say in summary that all of us agree that Nashville needs uh, better mass transit. That has been common to every person's statement that is here. But we're also finding that uh, exactly what that means and how that is implemented is, uh, is not an easy process. Um, I believe that we have to find a way forward. We have to do that quickly. And um, I think that this is one step towards making that happen. In conclusion, I'd also like to thank the staff that's worked really, really hard to present to us and to bring us those things and to answer the questions that we have. Um, but again, thank you each for all of the time that you have spent learning about what's going on. Our meeting is adjourned.